You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and we have a really, really cool guest today. We have Andrew Redding on. See, got it right that time. Yes. Um, we were just making fun before we started here that I can't read worth shit, which is my wife will back me up on that one there. Um, I wanted to get a different personality on to talk about another part of angling, which is being in the back of the boat, being in teams, kind of like the different side of the industry. Um, but we'll get into that all eventually. But first, Andrew, yeah, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure having me, man. Thank you for reaching out. And I've followed this since you started this whole little podcast series. So I think it's cool that you reached out and you wanted to talk to a guy like me. And I was like, all right, let's do this. Let me offer, let me offer my food for thought for people. (laughs) It's all like, I've always told people like, especially now that, um, if you guys didn't know, it's like Kevin Van Dam actually listened to the podcast and, and posted it on his thing a day ago because I, I interviewed, um, bullshit swim baits, Mike Buka. And it's funny because I have people like, oh, you got to interview more bigger people. And it's like, I don't want to. Like, I'm not trying to compete with that. Um, I grew up listening to like the junkies talking about how much the Redskins suck. And it's like, it's okay just to be local. I only want to do local talent or things that affect this area. And a Mike Buka, that makes sense because people throw swim baits like that. Yeah. That's that's a no duh. But now, like, just save the national stuff for the national stuff. And I'll just deal with this market here because it's like, it matters to me, honestly. Um, well, you're, more so. yeah. You're also the only one. I mean, besides, um, I can't think of them. They do the BFL, not Bass Reefer. Uh, oh, I know you're talking about. Yeah, what's their name? Why am I blank? Why am I blanking on? Them? They ABA. No, not the ABAs. They do. It's either Bass Resource, like they do a lot of Smith Mountain Lake tournaments, and they do like little, like short, uh, you know, tournament videos and stuff like that. But that's the only one that offers, but they kind of just cater to Kerr Lake and Smith Mountain. I mean, sometimes they come up and do the James for bigger tournaments, but they don't. Yeah. Yeah. I got to figure out who he is because, yeah, he does like 10 minute podcasts, like episodes. And yeah. He's very North Carolina, Carolina centric. Yeah. He does like a lot of the cats and stuff. And I think he's down like in that area. That's where he is. But like, you know, which I think is cool about your podcast is, you want to talk about local guys with a lot of local talent around here. And there's plenty of people that can talk and give information to this region from the bay down to shoot all the way down to Kerr Lake. <laughs> there's so many local sticks, and that's what's so what is the difference between a regional stick and I'll say let's say regional because regional and, and local. Let's say that kind of stick versus the top one percent, the national sticks, and to me. This is a hot take, but I will still die on this. It comes down to money and just having your chance. Like I, I really think like our local sticks, probably if they had that that their opportunity, they probably could make a name for themselves on the national scale. The biggest difference is you know, they either they had that lucky break or they just have the financial backing to, to chase that dream. And you see that in Texas and the Carolinas, there's so many great local sticks that you wouldn't know about unless you're part of that group. And I just don't know how what's the difference between them and maybe the 89th guy on like the elite series well we we can dive into that eventually because my opinion is that there isn't, there isn't a difference. i mean i was actually thinking about on the way home you know in case you brought something like that up and i'll use the guy as an example um his it's henderson um rodney henderson and he won i think he won like 30k on the river never left his house he, he never left home he won 30k on the river and Bass fishing is gambling. It's controlled gambling. Yes. And unless you have sponsors and even most of the time, the top 1%, you know, most of those dudes on the leads are paying for a lot of that. The gas, the gas sponsors pay, but they're barely breaking even. And sure, you're driving across the country to wrap boat that you got to sell and all this. It, it, it looks pretty on the front, but when you look at the paper and the pay, mm-hmm. it's not as glamorous. And I look at a guy like Henderson, Dude never left his house, went and fished his body of water 130K. What do you think his investment was? And that's something interesting, too. Can you make a <laughs> decent living? Um, this is, 
I don't know where the hell this came from, from my brain. I think it was Jay Kumar did something about this a couple of years ago. What areas of the country can you make a living as a local stick? And they said like Texas, like Florida, maybe the Carolina area where you could just stay regional. There's so many big ass tournaments that you could still I, do well. Could you do that here? Oh, yeah. I mean, think about it. So let's just use an example like when the Opens came to the James. So let's say you fished an Open on the James and won it won a toyota right so that's what is it toyota prize pack is like yeah and then and then an open is no uh, idea about that it's like 10 bucks i think (laughs) i'll give you a shot (laughs) but i I think it's pretty high there but i i think like you're you're getting close to 100k just there okay your expenses and traveling if you live let's just say you're someone who lived in fredericksburg all right, your fuel and travel is nothing at that point. You went close to 100k just in two tournaments in a year. I mean, that's there, and that's and that's not even that's not even including Wednesday night pot you know pot deck tournaments where you go win 300 bucks to pay for your fuel for the weekend. <laughs> I I think you, I think you could do it here. It, I mean, of course, like I don't think Virginia gets the recognition that that Texas and all those other lakes do. Because we have tidal bodies, and you know, of course, we have our lake with birds and mountain. But other than that, you know, you don't see the elites coming here all the time. Right? It, what the last time the elites were here, two thousand, when Lucas was. I'm trying to think. Two thousand ten. Yeah. Two thousand something like that. Yeah, look, we're in 2023, and they haven't been back. And I also think it comes down to, you know, the James is now finally, I, I think this is like the best days of the James. If you look from the last like 20 to 30 years, and that was really a good private stocking program and a government funded program. I think if we could somehow rehabilitate Kerr and Gaston to get to averaging 20, 25 pound sacks, like what we're seeing at Lake Anna. Yeah. I think that's going to start drawing bigger tournaments there. Cause I think oh, yeah. once you have tournaments of open caliber, like we finally get on Kerr this year, so hopefully we have good bags to really yeah. show this place out. I think that's when you're going to see the real changing of this area. Because yeah, if you are not from here, you really don't know about Kerr. You don't know. No one knows about Smith, which is no. insane. No I one know. knows about. Kerr. No, it's like a hidden. It's like a hidden little gem. Even though when I used to travel, I it wasn't my favorite, like especially the Co. <laughs> um, but it, it's a it's a fun lake. I mean. It, and especially when those guys, I forget, what was it, two years ago when those dudes were busting, I think it was like a 30 or high 20 pound bag, I think it was like back to back, like towards like the tail end of the, of the uh, winter. Yeah, that, and I was like all pumped to go there and then I went to get the cocks. So w- with that said, like what got you into this crazy thing? Uh. So what kind of got me into co-angling actually was really funny is so I had I used to work in a bar um, in Alexander, Virginia, doing bar backing. And I had a you know a regular in my buddy Alex who I fish with now. And you know, he was my team partner for a little bit and then he traded me. But uh it happens. And uh he was fishing BFLs and we would fish you know the local team stuff and he's like you should really get into fishing bfls and i'm like yeah i don't i don't know man i was like i'm most of the time playing net more than you um <laughs> and i was like i was like if co-angling counts as me being a net guy i mean i guess and he's like dude look we're gonna travel it's me and our buddy brian and i think you really should give it a shot and try it out and i said okay forget it. let's do it and I fished a BFL on the Potomac, and I bombed, and I was like super not pumped about it. But I said, you know what? This is a challenge. I want to face it and travel and do it. And I did it. I did it for three years. I fished BFLs twice, and then I fished ABAs, which I did a little bit better. Um, but it just it was a buddy pushing me into doing it. I liked fishing. I played sports all my life with football and basketball and running tracks. So I had the competitive nature, and I was trying to find something to that adrenaline and that drive and that was definitely it it was fun and i learned a lot i just it it was the traveling and like we said with the money and all that it 
I started looking at this as trying to control the gambling in a better fashion. And that's what drew me more to going back to the team term because everything's split across the table. Now, with that said, do you have, do you have your own boat? Uh, no, I, I use my buddy, Eric. That's my team partner. We, I share his boat. I mean, for the most part, he covers most of the expenses. He practices. I mean, our, our little group of us four guys, I mean, we, I'm on a boat with either one of them. or They'll let me sometimes use a boat in a control situation <laughs> and doing all that. And they, they put me on the front to give me more experience because I eventually want to become a boater and own my own boat and get to set my wings flying and go make my own decisions by myself. But yeah, now I'm mostly jumping on the back of buddy's boat because I'm pretty experienced. And, and I think that's really important for people at home that want to get into this that don't understand like – ABA BFL great example it's anywhere between I think it's like 300 to like 500 bucks give or take to be a boater um, mm-hmm. gas practice the whole yeah. shebang yeah. you do a co-angler you do get a reduction in your price to do it but then I think what you lose is freedom creative control well, I guess well you, yeah you you lose the creative control and you lose the freedom but where people and this is where we can touch on it you know everyone says you're there to learn and yes, you are there to learn in a degree. But as I look at it too, there's plenty of co anglers that fish behind motors that are, should be on the front of the boat. And everybody knows that. And I think in these BFLs and all this stuff, you know, especially BFLs, yeah, they're labeled as a pro. You're the same as me as signing up. You're not a pro, you're a weekend warrior, and we're out there to fish and have a good day. Now, yes, you practiced it. It depends on how much time you invested. But at the end of the day, it's a one-day tournament, not multi-day. And if you don't cash, this might not be the reason you can't fight your your mortgage or pay your bills or anything. You're doing it as controlled gamble. And I think that's like the hard part where people lose. Is you both are out there to have a good day on the boat. Yes, the co-angler is there to learn, but also a co-angler can offer tons of information to the motor that help them. I mean, I know two accounts where I saved guys seasons on the COVID. Really? Yeah. I two dudes I saved. One of them, it was two of them were pretty funny. One of them, guy was on the James. He was a James guy. And it was one of the two days. Um, and all he needed to do was catch basically a limit to get him into the regional. He didn't need nothing big. He just needed to catch a limit points wise. And all day he didn't want to fish grass. That he just, <laughs> yeah. And I'm like sitting here thinking. He's like, and he kept, yeah. And he kept asking me. He's like, you were catching the grass. I'm like, dude, we were whacking them grass. Like, I was like, I've got a flat. You need a hole. Uh, excuse me. I said, I don't care. I was like, if you don't care about weight, you will get a limit in 20 minutes. I was like, your your call. And it was and it was one of those. It was that tournament where we had the hurricane. That came up, and I can't believe they let us out. I mean, it was like three to four footer. And he tried to run from Belmont to Pohe. And we, <laughs> and he, and yeah, and he, he stuffed some pretty good ones. And I looked at him, I said, dude, is this really worth it to go flip some docks? And he's like, I want to make the run. I want to make, I said, okay. I was like, let's do it. I was like, I don't agree with this, but mm-hmm. I don't get a choice. I just have to make sure I float. <laughs> That's it. And so we go all the way up there, and it's a dud. Water's muddy. Tide's not right. And, you go, and I think it was like 1 o'clock. We were doing it like 2.10 or something like that. And he goes, all right, you want to go to the grass? I said, yep, let's go. Let's go right back to Belmont. Took him into a flat. I threw him a swim jig, and he caught five fish and five back-to-back gas. And weighed in like I think he had like twelve ish pounds. Both got our limits. I almost advanced the day two with my bag. Nice. Um, which for some reason I do better in two days than solo day. If you look at my my stats, I finished like in twenty or better in the two day tournament than single. I don't understand. <laughs> Man, that makes sense. It sounds like you just need an extra day to adapt to the the environment and the circumstances. Yeah, yeah. 
I get, yeah, maybe it's the pressure or something, but I had that one. And then I had another guy where it wasn't a spot that I took him to, but it was, a, it was a presentation. I told him to change. I said, Hey, look, I literally fished this flat on a weekend basis. And I was proceeding to whack him behind him and he was getting stubborn. And I said, dude, take this bait, drag it, whim it, do whatever the heck you want with it. You're going to eat it. And he finally fed up and took it. And he caught his limit. I was like, I'm here for you to have a good day. And you're here for me. Not one. Care like, I care if you don't. <laughs> so it, that was a there's so much there. There's so many rabbit holes I want to go down with that because it's like on one side of it, you're right. Like they're not professional anglers, and we'll we'll get into that rabbit hole. Yeah. Eventually. But yeah, the pros, FLW bass, everyone like that. They they eliminated co anglers because yeah. And at least my thought is, in one sense, I've had a co angler save my day before. Um, I think a lot of anglers that have been on the front of the boat have had that. But then part of it is like, should that be or should I just fail? If I, is it better for the sport not to have co-anglers where this guy, whoever it is, has to live and die with his choices without having a lifeline? I don't know. Like I, I've always felt that, but then on the same token, I think it gets back to what you said at the levels we're talking about, are you actually considered a professional? And that's, and that's, and that's where I'm kind of like my angle at it. And don't get me wrong. If that's your aspiration and you're using these to step up and go. Mm -hmm cool until that's your main source of income and that's all you do and nitro is giving you a boat and all these people are giving you boats and gear and you're out there vlogging and that's your thing then that's your thing but when you're on there and your wife is calling you or you're still getting work calls while you're fishing in dfl you're not a pro you're out there just like me doing controlled gambling Talk, talk a bit more about that. I, that's interesting. Controlled gambling. What do you mean? So it, I, I guess where I'm referring to that. So I was listening to Todd, yeah, Todd Castledon. He was a very successful guy, uh, especially tournament and legend in Texas and all that. And he, what he was talking about and where I'm referring to controlled gambling is you're picking tournaments based on situations that give you the best percentages to do well. And not saying cherry picking. I'm saying is you're branching out to fish within your strength. Like me, I grew up fishing tidal bodies of water. All I care about is doing well on tidal bodies of water. I don't need to go to the Harris Chain of Lakes and get my teeth kicked in. Where I understand tide, grass, shallow fishing. Yeah, I could probably go down there and learn that. But for my financial means, it's a much better... It's a much smarter gamble to stay close, fish something I know, to use that to then potentially, if I want to take the leap, to propel me going forward. So you got to make smart decisions going forward where you put your money to go fish. If that kind of makes sense, like don't go fish a Wednesday night or because there's five boats there because you can collect thirty dollars even though it's fifty dollars again. No, yeah. I mean it. it... Yeah, it, it makes so much sense, and it's such a weird. Oh, I'm so conflicted because it's like the whole, I, like what Bass did, going mm -hmm. back to the format in a vacuum. Yeah. In a vacuum, it makes logical sense. Yeah, having you fish across the country will, in theory, make a better product. It makes complete logical. Oh, sense. it totally, it totally makes sense, and it also eliminates guys like my mindset that I'm a local and I'm cherry picking. Mm -hmm. but, but you can't, but you can't not, but you can't knock that. that. <laughs> you can't yeah. and and also too you're gonna have to beat a local stick because at one time in a situation a local is gonna get their shot on their title body on their local body of water like in lee livesey but how local are you at that level and what i mean is if you are jason christie and i've been watching a lot of his stuff right now he doesn't get to fish his place as much it when it's in the juice as he used to, because now he's going all over God's country. So you have historical knowledge on that body of water, but I just don't know. Like the only exceptions I think really to this would be like smallmouth guys and maybe tidal guys. 
Yeah, but you're talking generically just pure lakes, Alabama lakes, blueback, stuff like that. It's like, I, I, I don't know. Do I think there's some advantage there? Absolutely. Do I think the home field advantage, generally speaking, is as big as people think? Not as much yeah. anymore. And, and I guess so, like, we're getting back to, like, local sticks and stuff. I do agree with you at that super high level. Like, yeah, there is something there where if, if the money wasn't involved optically, I do think probably fishing a national tournament trail like that makes the most sense because it's going to teach you to get out of your comfort zone, move around, and then you don't have that one guy who just jackpots the tournaments. I get that. Exactly. I get biggest thing from a business perspective is the optics are terrible that you're basically telling guys they have to now shell out fifty to $100,000 a year. Oh, that's think, not. Yeah. That's the thing. Well, even if you listen to, I don't know if you listen to um, Chris Daldane's podcast, The Bilge. Bilge? I have yeah. Is that any good? It's good, dude. I mean, production's incredible. I mean, he's got the Battleborn truck. And I mean, you know, you need the Battleborn truck or Jade Spade and Tackle truck going around, you know. So um, with that, um, but, you know, he it, it, it's a cool. And he had Matt Heron on there. Huh. And Matt Heron, I think he said, like, roughly it's about 80K. Okay, that's your starting point. Damn. All right, you're you're at eighty k. You would have to win. What? What is first place again? If you win a an elite series, I wish I had all the money. An elite series is a hundred thousand dollars, but then taxes. All right. Could okay, so a hundred thousand minus taxes, you're barely in the positive, just winning one. So I mean. That's what I'm talking about with like controlled gambling. You sit there and look at it. I mean, some of these dudes, like unless you're the Scott Martins, the Kevin Van Dams, the Jacob Wheelers, a lot of these dudes are still. I mean, you look at it. Uh, Brian New is laying pavement now. He's a bug pest guy in the off season. Like they have to work other jobs just to even make ends meet, and that's crazy. Because are you really a professional? Because in my eyes, as a professional, now this will probably get a lot of people. Professional is a paid salary. You don't have to do anything else. Yep. I, I bet you're into football right now. And guess what? Yeah. Like, uh, none of those sheep, those Chiefs people have to pay $100,000 a year to play every new season. Well, in the NFL. and that's my point. And, you know, and I felt like professional bass fishing back when Walmart was in, like, you were getting close. Yeah. yeah. And then they, and then they kicked the door down. And now and we're left. left. First season, they, they did it kind of there where, they didn't pay entry fees. Well, exactly. And they did. And the problem is MLF did their whole fighting with bass. And now you created yeah. this dark, you know, freaking Star Wars fighting each other. Mm-hmm. And and really at the end of the day, you both are foolish because you had you had the platform. It was there. Knock it all you want or call people sellouts. They were actually professionals because they didn't have to pay to show up. They got paid mm-hmm. to show up. That's what we want the sport to be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's I mean, it's crazy. Well, yeah, but it's just the thing is, is that until the sport, and the thing is, is I feel like Bass has the platform to do it, and they need to find a way where these dudes on the elites don't freaking pay to show up. It when you get to the elites, it should be covered for you. That's, Bass, Bass got so complacent though. I think yeah. people always forget this. That when the whole MLF thing started, it was because there were so many people that were sick of the way Bass was doing things. And I feel like nowadays no one remembers that. But they, but that's like Ike and Ellie want to go on Ike Live and, and, and hint at all this stuff before he and so many professionals jump ship. And it's like, that was because Bass – the catchway release thing Bass did first with the Texas Bash yeah. every year. Yeah. So, I mean, this shouldn't be the shocking thing where it's now Bass versus MLF. Like, Bass did it first. They just – they dropped the ball. They should have been the ones to pioneer that stuff and try to integrate it. And well, so, yeah, that, exactly. And it, it just – it's just funny in the sport, and that's where I'm going to stick with my stance is stay local, fish, get good enough on your local buys or that you can sit there and look on the calendar and you say, you know what? This week I'm going to go fish and go collect a check. Mm-hmm. And all you're going to do is wake up out of your own bed drive 20 to 15 minutes down the road, go collect a check, come right back. <laughs> and what is your expenses? The same that you would be if you went fishing that day anyway. You know, you know, uh, you know, oh, duh, you know, you know, McCluskey, right? Yeah, that's my good bud. <laughs> yeah. So I, 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 I talked about this with him. Um, I think his episode will drop for this one, but anyway, like a bell curve of, of talent to where let's say you are a, a tidal river expert. You're, you're great at it. 
at what point do you stop fishing tidal water because there's no like as much because there's just no more uh tactical advantage that you get for putting more time on that and then it's like well i need to go work on deep water now and, and so i think of it like a a baseball player a pitcher that's really really good at throwing his fastball okay you've been throwing that fastball for about six years please stop practicing it as much. If you can't throw that, then you're off that day. Practice something else. Work on that curveball. Work on that slider. Work on that other piece of your game. If you're a tidal water rat and all you do is fish tidal water, at some point it's like, listen, how about you take a few days off tidal and go practice deep clear water or live scope? And I feel like what does hurt some locals is they stay in that echo chamber too long to where it's like, I'm great on the Potomac, but if you put me on the St. Lawrence, I'm like, I don't know how to use a spinning rod. Like, yeah. At, at what point would you gauge yourself like, okay, if I want to become a pro, I'm good enough at this. Now I need to practice other facets of my game. Well, yeah. And, and that one, I mean, that's all opinionated. I mean, that's why I fish with Matt. I mean, Matt is, it, with him with active target and fishing the res and all that, I mean, he laughs me all the time for that great one. Like, I, you know, I pull out, he looks at me, he goes, dude, you're not on the river. I go, my comfort. And I'm gonna and I'm gonna make it work. And he laughs because I make it work sometimes. And you're right. And I think that's that has to be the drive person that you want to do that. Some people are so complacent that they're fine with the river for the rest of their life and that's all they want to do and win. Now, some people, I mean me, of course, I wanna get better at deep water. I wanna learn how to fit target. So if I go fish a lake and a winter series. I don't get my teeth kicked in by EJ and Matt. I can at least compete, you know, with them. But at this time now with no boat and all that, what do I get a benefit? Because I'm not at the front of the boat learning and doing that. On the river, you don't have to be at the front of the boat fishing tidal to learn everything. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, no, it absolutely does. But let's say like in this world tomorrow, you you get a, a boat and you can fish. Like, do you feel confident enough now, generically, and you'll know, see my point at the end of this is, like, you can go out on the river and hang par with everyone. When you had a boat, you could probably hang par with everyone. No, it's too random. Explain. So, the river, the river's always changing. Man. We learned this during the COVID. We were fishing, I mean, my buddy Brian and Alex, they, those two guys were borderline guide because their job allowed them to fish on the river or you know they had the ability and these guys would you know fish like a guide all week go out of the tournament struggle and bomb and it's like dude you've had the most ultimate practice you could ever have and it's in the reason what i'm saying is that river constantly what you did on sunday might not correlate to the next sunday and when you go out there it's not a guaranteed every flat that you're going to go and get bit and catch the winning bag of fish. You almost have to stumble upon it. And it's hard to go out there and say, okay, I'm going to go whack 22 pounds. Flip, flip. So then what you're saying is you should then diversify your portfolio and practice your, your forward facing sonar on the res or Lake Anna. You yeah. should do that. And so if you had a boat, you wouldn't just throw all your time in on tidal water. No, I, I wouldn't throw all my time in because. I understand the basics of it. I understand that spots have tied sensitive windows and that's where you maximize your bites. And you have to just basically run around like an idiot. Find my philosophy is four to six areas that are productive with the tide cycle. And you just run them around. And either they click or they don't. Where you go there and beat your head in Monday through Sunday, you're not you're not going to benefit that much. The river has only got, it only fishes so big. So you're just retreading over a bunch of stuff that 30 other guys just retreaded. If you kind of get what I'm saying, like you're not going to find, you're not going to find a hidden little gem that 40 other dudes didn't find. <laughs> That's, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because like growing up here, we got to fish high school tournaments on the river and I would always jump in like teams tournaments way back in the day, do all that stuff. And we were always like middle of the pack Mm -hmm. river anglers. 
And so I, I just never thought of myself any good. Then you go to college where back in the day it was regional based. So you had to fish all the tournaments. So it was like you go to Ohio, you fish a pond, you go up to Lake Champlain, and then you come back to the title. And then that's where it blew my mind where then we're automatically finishing in the top 10, top 15, because we have that instinctual knowledge that a team from Ohio just has no freaking idea. Like, yeah. And that, that kind of, that really changed my mind. I was like, okay, well in the vacuum of the, the 200 people that live here on the Potomac, you're whatever. But yeah. when you then compare yourself to a regional format, you almost get a bump up because of your local knowledge. Well, it's all, so to stay on top of that, do you remember the regional two years ago where the top 10 were all Ohio anglers and not only one local made it to the second day? Uh, BFL? Yes. They're right there. And every stick that was on the river fished that. And 10 Ohio guys found a 60-yard grass stretch and proceeded to whack them on frogs when no one else could. I, I, had, a, I had the guy that won that thing on the show. Um, he was actually a college kid I competed against a lot. And it's funny because I know for him, that was like his eighth tournament on the river. But now here's the funny part. We drove across that. Really? We looked at it. We didn't fish it. We looked at it. But see, that's where we, because our local knowledge said, no, don't waste your time. There's juice somewhere else. Interesting. So we weren't, so you get what I'm saying is we, we yeah. weren't fishing. We weren't fishing open. We weren't fishing. I always joke about it with my buddy on the boat as I go, I go, let's just do something crazy. Let's just go completely against it. Like, flush. Fish, just flush. Just do something weird. Do something something not normal. Because when you fish it all the time, you get a repetitive. You go stay in flat. You sit there. You wait for the tide cycle. And you're like, okay. Oh, they didn't. Now what do I do? I'm broken. My sand goes broken. I can't catch a fish. But yet, you turn on active target, there's 50 bajillion fish in that flat. So you don't, your brain doesn't process because you're in the same rhythm doing it all the time. Hey, yeah, that, yeah. You know what? Yeah. I like, yeah. Cause that makes yeah. sense. Huh? Yeah. And that's why like, I, you know, where I try and branch out and go do fish stuff with that fish deeper because it clears my mind, even though I'm never, I, I joke with them about the active target. I go, yeah, your active target was all fun. Wait until you get to the river, then he goes and busts the pounds. I'm like, wrong there. But I was like, you only get certain windows to use that. <laughs> so, and there and there's different things like that. And we joke with it back and forth, you know, active target and fishing river at or shallow. And you know, we <clears throat> we bounce ideas off each other, and I, you know, and it's fun to go out and see what he does with that stuff and look at it. Well, that was a great that was a great seminar. Now I'm gonna go fish at the grass flat and throw a frog for four hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The technology is here to stay. And yeah, you've got to learn how to use that. I I think it's learning how to optimize that in different situations, and I think that's what hit you know, again Matt, who we're talking about right now, and other yeah. individuals like him who just know that technology, but know the subtle nuances of when to use it where. If you just read a pamphlet on where to use it, everyone thinks that way. But once you get the reps and like he has, you just you, you think of things differently and how to implement yeah. that technology. And and that hasn't clicked in me yet. Now, granted, like I said, because I got the title and the body, you know, I pay attention to nature. Like I'm, you know, fish and saltwater birds is like your hobby. Like I talk about it all the time, and I do it all the time. If I see coots on the river, I'm like, oh, there's fresh grass. Even though there's not a big coot population, but I see two or three coots, I'm like, yeah, probably grass here. And usually it's emerging on the grass. And I go, oh, thank you, bird. Not messing with that. I'm like, yeah, active target like that. <laughs> but it can't. But the active target is, yeah, that's, I love, it's such a fascinating debate. I, I it is. So few things that pitch anglers against each other so much, like, like that debate. Well, it, it does pitch them together, but like where I'm, I guess like some of us younger anglers and all that is we look at it, it's another tool in the tool belt. And we're open to this stuff versus other anglers who had the repetitive way to fish that they don't want to learn it. 
and then they talk bad about it it's like dude that thing has a power and a time and place just like your favorite just like your favorite bait has a time and place and season that it outfishes anything else take it earn it and use when you need to use it the yeah. superpower though really is to me it's how the more technology you get and the more techniques that you learn is when to use it at what circumstance because that's where you get just that that information overload and it's something that the, the more i fish and think and think about diversifying my game the more i appreciate john cox and poche who are like yeah fuck it i'm just taking a transducer off my boat yeah they <laughs> just don't care uh, that's it yeah and it's like that is so liberating because if all i have is a shaky like a shaky head a wacky rig and a swim jig on my boat that's it no transducer my day is very easy like i know exactly what i'm gonna do there's no voices in my head See, I'd freak out because that's where my voice is going in my head. I'm like, really? Man. Oh yeah, I, I, I get into the head games with stuff a lot that I need to work on. If I had this or that, I'm a big tackle guy, you know, and special colors and stuff like that. And oh god, yeah, yeah. And and tweaking stuff, and you know, this little tweak does that. And you know, I've seen times where it works. And I, I do it all the time. I'll you know, be out fishing, and you know, I'm not getting a bite, and my buddy's getting. I'm like, maybe if I take a nail weight and shove it in this work. And then I fish it for like 30 minutes, nothing happens. I move the nail weight, move it, move it. And also I start getting bites. Mm -hmm. But that's me acting like a squirrel on the back of the boat doing a whole bunch of crazy stuff. And my buddy's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm a tinker until I get a bite. But that's a good thing. I, I, you say a squirrel, like it's, I, so there, I think there's two types of anglers in this world, 100%. You put them into two different categories. It's, you got the, the Western Japanese style anger and you got the, the good old Southern boy. And I, this is how I, I visualize it. You put them both at a pond to fish. The, the, the Western Japanese guy is going to get to his tackle box and he's going to tinker. The guy from the South is going to throw his spinner bait for 20 minutes and say, like, there's just no fish in this pond and leave. Exactly. Or the tinkerer, who's the Japanese style anger, he's like, no, the fish are here. I just need to figure them out. And exactly. And, and, and so it's so funny because, like, I know, like, uh, Chris Arvin comes on the show. He's a big time power fisherman on the river. And he's got a couple of baits and hell or high water, they're going to eat that. Great if that's you. I am more of a guy because I grew up fishing more ponds in Northern Virginia. Yeah. There's 10 bass in here. I just need to figure it out and just adjust stuff. Exactly. And well, and also too, and I guess like with mine too, is like where I get, because like I, I do a lot of like, I'll leave an area and I go, well, I didn't try enough. I need to go back. Yeah, and I do too much of that, and I get and I get into my head where I need to slow down. And tinkering is good, but tinkering can get you in trouble because if you don't, especially in the river with the tide, you know, yeah, they might not be eating a batter or a shadow wagon, as we call it, at that specific time. But you get the right tide window, you get right in a hurry. But you cut it off already, and you're throwing something different. You didn't give it its time. So those are the times where like it can hurt you. Cause then you go back and weigh in and the guy's like, oh dude, I whacked him on a chatterbait. You're like, we were in the same craft line the entire day. So then, <laughs> with that mindset, if you're gonna be a co-angler or you could give advice to to anyone listening that's gonna be a co-angler this year, it doesn't have to be at the BFL level, uh New Horizon Bass Club, mm -hmm. Genitoa Bass, there's all, there's tons of kids out there that want to get into this. How do you prep for it? So let's just do Potomac River, super easy, or James, you know, which yeah, one, yeah. How, how do you prep to get well, in the back of the boat? Well, prepping in the back of the boat is, first off, it sounds repetitive, but you, you have to bring first off what you're confident in catching fish. In. That's the jump. You have to, whatever your bait is that you think you can go out and catch fish, that you grew up catching fish on, that has to be in the boat. Pick two to three colors, that little juice color, in hell or high water, you're going to use it. Then you can get, you bring a little bit of, I call him Tinker, or, you know, as Epic Eric, he's always messing with baits. I don't know if you listen to Epic Eric at all with uh, Fall Mouth Crush. He's like me. He's always tinkering, using crazy stuff. And you bring those because you have to have something to be different. So you have to bring a good load of confidence, normal, traditional stuff but then you sprinkle in a little bit of the maybe it's a japanese bait that no one or it makes a different sound and when you're in a grass flat with all these people or in a big community hole 
what can you do to be different? If that makes sense. And you got to bring some of those to have as people. Yeah, sure. Go throw your shit head to you know, your uncle. But you can do that all day or you can bring rattles and shove it to the top of them or do something. So like what I tell a lot of codes is bring your, bring your confidence, in. bring five to six, sometimes seven rods that get the job across the, across the board, but make sure you're organized that you can get to everything. Don't, I see guys do it all, we were actually talking about it yesterday. You know, those big like boat tote tap bags, like yeah. the ones that like carry all your Plano boxes. Man, I've seen Coes carrying that at BFLs with like the huge like Bass Pro Shop boxes with that and it's like dude i am all for every but there's no way in the back of the boat especially if you don't get to make a decision that you're going to use any of that and sure you're covered but that's to another level <laughs> that's a very good point because you're yeah. not really speaking making the decisions you don't have the you know the the, the the artistic freedom when you're out there so are, are you trying to fish for the same fish as, as the, the boater? No, no. And I, and I had to learn that the hard way. When I first started, I had the normal young driven co-anglers. I'm going to beat the guy. In front of the boat. Bad idea. Not going to work. He's got the best cast. You can't fish, you know, of course, you know, how co-anglers, you stretch the line of fishing at that 45 degree. Angle. You're trying to hurry him up if he's down a bank and, you know, that that burns you. And what I try to do is whatever my boater's doing, I am completely opposite. If he's throwing a shaky head, I'm power fishing. If he's power fishing, I'm throwing a finesse. And I'm going opposite of what he's doing. Because either he's not triggering fish or he's triggering a fish and I'm trying to use a follow up bait based on his power fishing. If that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, like if he goes by like let's just say like a wood lay down, he's running a crankbait right fish might not eat it but the fish knows something's there and then i skip my little texas rig worm in there now that slower presentation that fish is already active and now i might get that bite so my main thing is that you don't try to compete for your boater's fish you you look for openings when you get them and of course i'm always like you're out there to fish too if he leaves a brush, if he leaves a, tr a lay down tree wide open, hey, you saw it first. <laughs> you, you get to cast at it. Or, or you be polite and have a conversation. Say, hey, can I fish that tree? They got the cast. But I base on the situation if the guy's paying attention. Because there's tons of times, like if you're going down, like I'll use the James for an example. People get mad at cross creaking. The front of the boater can't control the entire. If he's fishing on the left side and he's not even casting at the right side, why are you not allowed to cast it? Does that make sense? What's cross creaking for the people that don't know? So cross creaking is if you're in a creek that's about the boat length of a boat, okay? So if you've got laydowns on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, let's say your boater is fishing the left-hand side and you are fishing the right-hand side. Some boaters will call that cross creaking because they say, we're going to come back and fish those. Mm. which which is is basically you're telling him that you have to he basically wants you to just fish behind his trash which isn't always a negative thing but you're you're deliberately putting your co-anger at a disadvantage and that's where i talked about this stuff odors that was your choice to go into a little creek that he can cast across it now if i was a boater i would flip both sides and put that's how I would, you know, or do or put the boat in a position where I'll give my co or that sign. That's just the, the fate that I've dealt at that. Point. How important is communication? Huge. You, you have to when you get in the boat, you got to remember, you know, at the end of the day, this guy's not going to be invited. Guy or girl is going to be invited to your wedding. No one said you're going to get in a job or nothing like that. But you have to be able to enjoy each other's company. And you have to be respectful of this person's property, you know, and, and communication is big. Like how I start the morning, I mean, I'm a nice guy, so usually I don't have any be talking with anybody. Um, I can work a conversation out of <laughs> So I, I do okay with that. But 
is laying down the ground rules saying, hey, do you want me to get my net? Um, do you have your back apartment open so I can put my tackle in? So like, you know, tripping hazards, you know, where do you want trash put? You know, I always like to, it's my joke, I offer the sandwich in the morning. That's a little, as a little tip, you know, I, I think food is, food is good for the soul and that's a good way mm-hmm. to make someone like you. Um, but you're, as you said, it's communication. What are the ground rules? If you disagree with the ground rule, have a conversation about it, try and work it out and get to know each other before you go take off and stare at each other for seven and a half hours. <laughs> you know, you, you got, no one said you had to like each other, but you got to be at least cordial. Mm-hmm. So that, that's the biggest thing is ground rules. I mean, I always ask, you know, how do you, you know, slam it lids? And, you know, do you keep what where? I ask them simple questions like that so I know what it is. It's expected of them. Some dudes say net my fish, some say don't. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, it's, the biggest thing, I love what you said about property. It's like you're getting on somebody's boat. It's a boat that for most of us, when we were co-anglers or when we were younger, we want that. We want a boat. So don't don't be smoking a cigarette. Don't be you getting the dye out and just dunking it all over the carpet. Like, like that is the number one thing to really make the relationship sour. If you dump yellow dye all over the damn carpet. So I'm bad. I bring the dye, but I bring the neutral on it. But okay, you bring, I said, yeah. So, like, and I hold it up when they look, I'm like, Mm-mm, I got it. I, I don't worry. <laughs> like, I have, I'm I, one guy that brought this plane out with foam, and so he opened it up. So, there's this foam and a towel. So, he would dip inside the box, pat dry it, and then he'd go. That guy was great. Then, I had another guy that had jack and shit and just dripped it all over the carpet. Yeah, that, yeah, and that, and you, and, and what, yeah, you got to respect the guy's property that mm-hmm. that's the one thing where i think a lot of people don't totally do you know like from pulling them out of the water you know so many co's get off the boat they're like i openly admit if you can't back a trailer down yes. it, it, it's okay there's so many times i ask guys like this all the time i i learned the bad way with the tailgate down and i'll admit it i can back the heck out of a trailer with the tailgate down i do crazy stuff that. And let me add to that too. It also the boat ramp. So example is Lisavania, if you guys don't know, is way better than Smallwood State Park. Yeah. You know, bite me. I don't care. That's true. So yeah, yeah, if you got a packed BFL morning at Smallwood, I would be like, if you really don't feel like you can do it, that's fine. Don't yeah, Just, don't do it. And and openly admit it. And most guys are cool about it. And they'll tell you jump on the boat if you're cool with drawing up or something like that. Or they say, Okay, well here I'm just gonna float you off, hold it on the dock simple simple stuff like that and that's where you have to be open there's tons of guys who are like I, i'm not comfortable with caps and like i remember one guy he was like no no you can do it. i was like dude no i was like you got an f-250 with a cap. i can't see i was like i'm not trying to wreck your stuff i was like i i said i'm more uncomfortable bringing the boat around and i said i'm i won't load it for you because it's not mine and i don't want to mess up and Sure, I can load it, but I'll troll motor it up, and then you jump on and power it or something. And then we worked it out. But that's where you have to openly talk. You, you, it's okay if you can't do it. But so many guys are so nervous about. It. I'm like, dude, for how much as I fish, and I'm not an expert at back in the trailer, I tell people if you can't do it. Sorry. <laughs> yes, yeah, so like open communication. Don't pack a whole Bass Pro Shop. You know, pack the essentials. Um, you know, don't destroy the equipment. I mean, is there anything else really you could think of, like for people that are starting out? No, I mean, it, well, and also too is keep a keep an open mind that you don't get to control the day. And yes, the first part is you're there to learn, but you're there to compete, and you have to understand how to keep that in a calm, field manner. You're there to compete and potentially win some money, but you're also there to learn a little bit. And anybody can learn from anybody from the front of the boat to the back of the boat. It goes vice versa. Even pros learn from people. It, it just it that's how the sport is. Okay. So the thing is, is you have to understand is yes, I'm here to compete. I want to win, so I can go home and show my buddies. Yeah, I got a trophy. I won, cash a check. But you have to understand too, you're there to learn and you might not get put in a situation where you win. And don't be that guy coming back to the ramp like, oh, my boater didn't have me on fish and this, this, and that, because all you're going to learn is a bad rap. 
and be respectful because yeah, your boater might not have been around fish. Who says you would have put yourself in that situation? Mm-hmm. That's why when you ask me if I had a boat and went out, I, I can't look at you and say straight in your face, yeah, I'd catch him every time. I'm not gonna admit I'm not gonna openly say something like that. Because that jinxes you. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that humility does go such a long way to be to understand the situation to be like, listen, you are a co angler, not a boater. And I think if that is interpreted correctly at the beginning of the day, it 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 stops a lot of this stuff. Mm-hmm. This guy's not guiding for you. You know, yeah. he paid the money to be a boater. You didn't. I, I guys, I hate to be so straightforward, but that's the that's that is what it is. Yeah. And so you approach the day like that. I think there's a lot of more mutual respect going around. And that and that's um, the biggest thing, and that's that's the playing field. And most of the time, you usually have a good day, and you actually be surprised. Your boater might throw you a lure they're catching, or your boater might say, "Hey, we're sucking. What's your idea?" Mm-hmm. And then you're like, game on. Now I get, now I'm technically fishing as a boater because I'm getting to decide where we go. And now here's my te- time to test my thought logic. That pans out for me. That's how I look and, at it. And it's also, you're just, it's a tight knit community, especially at the BFLs and mm-hmm. things like that. And so if you are thinking that you're going to be a co angler, for a while, I would assume you would want a good relationship with people because yeah. rumors spread. Oh, yeah. If you're a dick one day, guess what? That might follow you for a couple of years. Oh, yeah. And that's not, and that's not what you want to do. That's why I say it. just treat others as you want to be treated. Keep the tackle simple. Of course, bring your special. You know, this lore is the lore. And that's your confidence bait. And you bring that. And then little tinker test baits, six to seven rods so your baits are covered. And Basically, create yourself a management system that you're quick and efficient. That's my main thing. Is you know, don't have the big bag. And everything. You're opening up, you're jumbling around to find that one green one you can go. But you had to dig all the way to the bottom of your bag to find. It. So that's the big thing. Organization, minimal tackle, be respectful. It will make your that's fine. <laughs> now with that. Segway, team tournaments. I guess uh, right now, who's you? Do you have a primary partner? Where yeah, you, like rotate or no, no. I'm not. A, I'm not a free agent. <laughs> <laughs> they, um, yeah, I have a primary partner. I fished with my buddy Eric Vasquez. Um, <clears throat> he was when me and Alex used to fish together. Eric didn't have a partner in the team trails, and my buddy Eric and Brian used to fish as team partners. But then they kind of like tried to do their own things. Together, and I said, "Well, I've got another buddy. I can jump on his boat." And that's how our became like our teams. So I mainly fish with Eric, and he's an awesome guy. He's he's a local, grew up here, Alexandria, Virginia. I'm I'm more in Northern Virginia, um, closer to Matt, and you know he, he's much older than me. So you've got youth and older, which is which is an interesting combination, but I think it's a good combination because he has knowledge and patience where squirrel, you know, I admit we might be in Bellhaven. I'm like, screw it. Let's go to Hawaii. And he's like, are you paying for the gas? And I go, he goes, all right, then we're not doing it. I said, okay, good decision. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, what tournaments or tournament trails do you guys do? Uh, try to do each year together so we strictly fish potomac river battles with ed dustin that's been our main one we really like what ed's bringing to the table with you know the social media and the facebook he does the border battle where he donates you know, some of the proceeds go to charity and we think it's it's a fun tournament and there's the local sticks he's from you know lenny burn all those guys you've got local hamsters we would like to fish more Potomac teams, but based on his schedule, he's a contractor, so he's Saturdays. So we leave those kind of open. Um, we were going to fish the Lake Anna Winter Series, but I was in the middle of moving, a lot of crazy stuff. Mm-hmm. So we don't do that. But for the most part, it's Potomac River Battle, whatever, like, when. So. And, and so for the people that don't know, the River Battles, I believe that's also called like the Battle of the Border Series. Yes, yes. 
yeah, it's the same thing. They're they're separate, but they're combined because you they have a border battle, which is Maryland versus Virginia. If you fish Potomac River battles and win a tournament, you automatically get put on. Mm. Okay, but you also get selected. So there's like I think like seven that's based on slots, and the rest is actual based on who the team are, the team captains. So they're like not involved, but they're involved. <laughs> they're, that makes sense. Yeah, there's a lot of questions in my mind about that, <laughs> but but it's a really fun series. It, I got to fish the border battle last year, and I got to really see what it was about. And I was like, okay, I was like, this is a big thing with charity, and I see the community, and I was like, I back it now, you know, because I was big on. I never, I didn't get to for like three years, and we did relatively well, but. It's because we weren't in the community; they didn't know us. We mm. were just we were just some random schmucks. <laughs> so, Andrew, something I'd be remiss if I didn't ask: like, did you ever think about getting into kayak fishing, especially where you live, where like you're close to so many bodies of water? It's not as expensive barriers to entry. Yeah, that it's actually funny. I've been talking about that with a buddy for about like two years now. So I'm in a, I'm in an apartment, so that's also part of my issue. I don't have storage. That's why I don't have a boat. You know, me and my wife were trying to buy a house within the next two to three years to open that. And I've been very open to kayak, kayak angling because I like that backwater shallow fishing. You know, it would be a new challenge. And I've wanted to do it and try to fish those tournaments. I know Matt fished one on the Doa and did one to the and he's like, dude, you got to get into it. I'm like, no, I want it. I'm good, but still in store. I, I thought about a pulley system on how to hang it out there, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah it, I, that's the thing about it. Like, I, this is my second year doing it, and there's a hell of a learning curve for mm-hmm. guys that just fished out a boat that I have not completely mastered yet. Yeah. Um, but the thing that, it keeps coming up with club members and stuff is like, yeah, I live in Ashburn and I have this little ass garage and I can't foot a 22 foot Skeeter, mm-hmm. but I can pimp out a 10 foot kayak. I know. And it's like, that makes sense. Well, no. And, and I, and I think it's awesome. Like what these dudes do with these kayaks. I mean, we see them out there on the river all the time. And like, he's got active target two grass. He's got a motor. And we're like, but he's got like 20 G's and like electronics on this yeah. thing. And then the worst part is he's coming behind us and whacking them. And mm-hmm. we're like, what's going on here? <laughs> and and we think it's cool. And I respect the big time. I, I've wanted to get into it, you know, because then it would open me up for traveling more and fishing other, you know, fishing other stuff. And I just haven't pulled the trigger. Yet. I mean, that's one that I, I, for everything, and I know some of my kayak friends give me shit about this. I just, if I had the option to fish the tidal Potomac on a kayak or a boat, it's going to be a boat every time. That that thing can get so mean. Like, I, I've never under, I mean, I get it from a club standpoint or tournament organizer standpoint when you put stuff on like Kentucky Lake and stuff. But, dude, man, that, those places can get, can get gnarly well, quick. Well, I forget who it was. It was a guy, it was that last, um, it wasn't the Toyota. It was when the, not with the Inventational, but the MLF that came. It, no, it might have been the Toyota. And it was one of the northern guys from like mm-hmm. Erie. And he sent a video. It was on his story. He was riding back from a client. It's a small one. And he said, this is the meanest ride oh, yeah. that I've ever been on. And he says, and I'm a great guy. And I don't think people underestimate, like, people don't understand is that, you know, I tell people all the time where I've been in that major. Five foot. I, I, we've been there times where I'm like, he might not make it. And I'm like, when that moon and tide and wind all compete against each other, dude, <laughs> it, it, it might not get as bad as Lake Erie. You know, I don't know if you saw that weather report around like Thanksgiving or was it Christmas? Yeah, the one where it was like 32 footer, who's the occasional rogue 38 or something like that. And it's like, excuse me, what? <laughs> absolutely insane yeah i know where is it bassmaster did something way back in the day i'm never gonna find this thing but i think potomac was like number three Mm -hmm. 
on the list for like most dangerous place to drive. Yeah. Um, like it was, it was eerie. It was like then the red river, something like that. Then it was like the tidal Potomac. It, it was something like that. Just because like you said, like when that stuff stacks, it's a washing machine. It's just absolutely gnarly. Well, dude, it gets crazy. And the one thing that we always talk about is that, cause I consider like, I'm used to the bay I'm striper fishing and I've been caught. I've been caught out in the bay and stuff that will make you go white. <laughs> And and the thing is, is that's roller, the Potomac checkerboard, and that's the crazy thing. It's like, yeah, you're focusing on these three footers. And you're like, okay, I got my run I'm safe, and then all of a sudden there's like a four out of nowhere. And you're like, where, where did you come from? Why, yeah. <laughs> why are you checkerboarding on me? And it's because of the wind, and the tide, and that's what. And, and especially, yeah, especially with tournaments in the spring, like again, like for us locals. Like, again, if you're a, a national guy, you're not coming here till like July, mm-hmm. but then like for us, you have a tournament. They're like, first BFL is going to be like February 27th. It's like, great. It's like every other day is a small craft advice. I know it's horrible. And then, and the one thing too, is where I respect those local, I, I call them the acquiable is no matter the They're, weather report, they go. And it's, it's not fun though. It's, I don't, I don't know. It's just like. Okay, I could win. I could win five grand, or I have to replace a trolling motor. It's like, I, it, dude, it just it mind boggles me. And don't get me wrong, we have the uh, the man courage moments where we're like, you know what, we're gonna puff our chest out, we're gonna do it. Mm-hmm. And then we get to the power lines, and we're like, nope, they're crazy. Go the other way. This is this is I, I can't handle. I mean, for a Toyota, like uh, or like a BFL, maybe I could justify it for a local tournament. No, dude, you're, you're, you're testing fate <laughs> for a local I, kept, I I have a crack on, on my gunnel that I will never um, get fixed as long as I own it. Maybe when I resell it because it was, um, my dad told me and I was prepping for an ABA in the spring and I was like, I, I he said like, if it's bad, don't go out there because I don't want to have to fix this. And so I decided to launch out of Madeline and just to make, try to make a run up. And I speared a wave and I broke two bolts off my Altrex at the time. And the head of the Altrex, it, it flexed enough because I hit the wave hard enough. It flexed and hit the gunnel hard enough. Whoa. Put a massive crack in it. Oh, my and God. It just absolutely obliterated the front of my boat. And so I, I turned around and went right back into Matter Woman. And it's, I, it was funny because I was thinking about trying to just to do this. But I'm like, okay. And I thought myself at the hotel at night. So even if I win this effing thing. There's even if I win it, that doesn't even break even the damage I just did to this boat. And that's and that's the hard part. Just and yeah, and it's like okay, so and I really changed the way I fish because it's like I used to be balls to the wall when I would run, when I do all this stuff. But it's like cool, I ripped my transom up, I'm screwed. I'm not getting a new one, you know. Yeah. The waves and stuff. So I've really chilled out when I got older, or maybe because I have to pay for shit now. It, <laughs> I don't it, know which, it's but, having to have to pay for shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's just, it's just, ah, dude, even if you catch them, it's just, that's, yeah, it's gutsy. Those guys that go down there for sure. It, 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 it mind blows me every time. And the funny part is just, you see them and they turn right and they don't come back. You're just like, <laughs> it's like, it's like that level of commitment. Is incredible. <laughs> and I mess with, and I mess with them. Like you could have done. And like the funny part too, is like, if they don't win now, even though like quiet statistically has the biggest bags on the river, period, I justify the run. Yeah, but you come back with fifteen, and you could have gone five minutes to Belmont, and not punished yourself. <laughs> that that's why I laugh. That's why I laugh at them. Like, did you really get what you wanted? <laughs> and that's such a great dilemma too, because it's like I I feel like a hot take is Aquia works in single day events, but it's hard to make Aquia work for four day events or Toyota events. Like it just seems if you look at the data, it's always people closer survive versus the people that make those long ass runs and again yeah. you'll have a justin lucas or that italian guy that went down to potomac creek you'll get that every now and then but it's like it's so weird in local stuff you can make long runs and survive if you're if you're fishing for a hundred thousand you want to be a little bit closer well, gen- generically speaking yeah you want to mix it up or you pull an adrian avina and go all over. Yeah, yeah and and there is and like you get those one-offs and the thing is is that i think those places down there are much more tide sensitive because they're more exposed to the bigger part of the river, where also, too, where I joke about it and where my beef is with it, is I go, you sell your soul, you only have one creek down. 
there's nothing else to fish. You fish Belmont, you can go into the Aquaponic. Yeah. The Belmont, you can stick, you can run to Quantico, you can run up to Pohit. You could run all over the place. Once you're down there, you're committed. And, you know, and that's the pro- that's my big problem with it. That's where when I go down there, I always play the head game where I'm like, was this 15 minute run really worth it? You know, because you can get down there in a good day. 15. I think it's also the mindset of what are you fishing for? Are you just trying to jackpot a tournament? Or are you trying to be up in the points? I yeah. think that is a big thing is like, if you're fishing the BFLs or the Toyota series and you're trying to finish in the top 10, mm-hmm. that's how you're going to have to pr- approach the river. Cause I, I feel confident enough now that if I had to fish for points, I probably I could do good. it. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? But then it's like, that's a different mindset. It's like, I'm going to jackpot it. And, yeah. and that river is so unique in that way where, yeah, you can have the mindset of fishing for points or fishing to win. I think it's what makes tidal water so unique is you have that ability where if yeah. I go to Smith mountain Lake, my winning pattern might just be like trying to like cash a check exactly. but on the river. I can do that. I can make that distinction. Exactly. You're totally right. And, and also depending on the time of year, you can pick and choose which, you know, target bigger fish doing certain stuff and you can make that fate decision. And cause the Potomac, I mean, dude, you can run it in the last in a second. Yeah. That's, that's fine. Might not be a big one, or it is a big one. Who knows? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and that's yeah. what and that's what I was saying is when you like falling back with, could you go out there and compete? It's such a crapshoot because if you don't time it right, you come back and it's like, dude, you whacked them all week on Instagram. They didn't like my saying go on Saturday. So then, let's say you get a brand new boat and you get to fish the BFL. Let's say the Shenandoah series. So you're going to have James Potomac, and I think you got Smith on the schedule, and I think you got one more lake. But let's just say you got two lakes, two rivers. Are you more worried about the title? Or are you going to be more worried about the Smiths and maybe a Kerr on the schedule? Uh, bombing. Like, who? What are you more afraid of bombing? I'd be more. I'd be more afraid of bombing the lake and the only well no i take that i take that back i would bomb one lake depending on the year and then of course the potomac because you just don't know the title you don't know based on the number i mean you could put yourself in all types of crazy situations and stuck or running running down there and, and, and stuff like that where there's issues but like you know like her for the most part you can survive you can run around through a carolina and put your hard dive for the most part. And then if they're up in the bushes, you just blow over Smith Mountain or not. But, you know, with Smith Mountain Lake, with the offshore and active park, and then of course you have 50 million dollars to go get. I mean, I'm not good at offshore. I can't, I can't just squirrel out and go do something like that yeah. and do that where like the James, I could roll up into a creek and get right in a hurry if I guess right. You know, and then the Potomac, I think, or I'd always be worried is because I have that knowledge and so much. Mm-hmm. I I then box myself. I'm like, well, I don't want to bomb someone. Please make a run. Okay. So you fish scared instead of fishing open. Or like the James, if I go and suck and like, oh, you suck. It's like I live two hours from here. I don't fish. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it's idle, but it has very little grass and mostly wood. <laughs> so yeah that that's interesting because yeah I, I would feel like for me on the title stuff it's like i i don't think i could ever win but i don't think i and this is i don't think i'll ever bomb to the point of like i'll, I'll zero whereas if i go to smith i'd be i might i have been like i might not catch a damn fish today <laughs> like I, I can't find the good ones where it's like potomac it's like if i can't find one grass flat i could throw a stick worm and catch something mm. like Maybe that's just because I grew up on it, but for some of those lakes, it's like, yeah, I don't. This is foreign as hell. Yeah, no, and I see what you're saying. I guess like mine is I, I do, I psych myself out sometimes, and that's where like the pressure of being on your own body, like, mm, yes, I can't yeah. suck. Where versus like you go to like her, and it's like that buck brush looks cool. Let's go flip it. That's and it's and, so, and something you know, and something crazy happens. And then on the James, you know. I mean, me, I'm in love with those diapers. I'll flip those until my heart desires. And you're either going to get lucky or you don't. 
but I don't care because I look two hours from yeah the title. Put me in a title grass plat, and then we'll have a conversation. You know, that's now flipping with title, and that's fine. But I'm pitching to a target where I can go cover 100 yards on grass plat and make a play. And if I get it right on the right side, I get it right on I got to pick the right row of stretches in Cypress Street to get bit. Get, get what I'm saying? It's. I, I really do. And I like, I like, I like, it, it's so weird because it's like, our views are the same painting here, whereas like mm-hmm. mine is like I never feel like I can really win on home water mm-hmm. because I know too much, but I also feel like I'm never not gonna like bomb. And yep. yours is like I just know too much information. And both both reviewing it, it's like it, it being the place that we grew up fishing. Yeah, it plays with your mind. Yeah, and I mean, then you look at McCluskey, and it's like he's paid his mortgage with with a certain lake and it's like how do you mentally tom brady that shit to where you can do that i don't yeah. understand and that's where i don't get it and don't get me wrong i think one day it will be my time and i'll get a win you know i, I think that will come with knowledge but i've got to learn the factor of okay i've got the whole alphabet of spots a a spot b spot c spot all the way to but you've got to time them right fish them right and do the right presentation, which I learned a lot last year about having better success is that slow down thing. Presentation, that's number one. Then you, you go, pre- what was it? Pre- presentation, profile, color. If you get presentation profile down, you could throw pink all day. It, it doesn't matter. That's what I've learned. And, and over there, and that was the time of COVID with beneficial music fish and I that stuff and, I and then the tide sequence and I started to slow myself down stop that out and I said okay tide sweep it sequence I can like if this, if this is the history I've had you know let's make it work and trust it and and I guess and I think it was like David Dudley said believe every spot's the winning spot <laughs> My, my, my buddy Eric talked about that. I the spot. He's like, we haven't caught a fish before. I was like, I don't care. It's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, like, again, you know, thank you so much for coming on. Um, I know on my end, it's been crazy trying to get, I've been wanting to get you on here for a while now. And yeah. Thank you so much for, for being able to be flexible. Like, is there any sponsors or anyone else that you want to give a shout out to? Uh, well, I mean, of course, you know, I've got my little gig with Dava Drive and get to support them, and I believe in their rods. And I also have a little scent deal with All In Tackle if you need little scents from the little liquid to the gels. They've got you covered, and I really trust them. Uh, it was the bait fuel before bait fuel. Remember that, guys. And then also, too, I have Swagger Tungsten. Uh, Swagger Tungsten. It's probably the best tungsten on the market for the price in my opinion. And even better, they make organization good for those co-anglers because they've got the weights printed on it. That is actually, I don't know why it took so long for some company to figure out, like, what if we just label the damn thing? Because, you know, I used to get like a gram scale and just mm-hmm. to rewrite shit to put it back because your boat can look like a shit show. Like, yeah. It's a brilliant, simple thing. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. And it's funny because it's like, I, I look at it and I look at the other tongues that I use and I'm like, because I always used to write on it. And like, uh, yeah. and trying to do that, and I'm like, this is that I just I, <laughs> like. You really, it's worth the money, just in it, that. <laughs> it is. It's worth the money. I'm like, dude, it's organized. I can tell. I can literally throw them in a box of hair, and I'm like, oh, I just want them. Here we go. <laughs> so, it yeah, it it works out. Dude, good deal. Awesome. Guys, again, as always, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about today, um, including all of his social media handles and all the sponsors. Again, please like and subscribe to the channel. We are the only and the fastest growing outdoor fishing show that represents Virginia, Maryland, D.C. metropolitan area. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.